Primocane blackberries are a, a, maybe a new concept, maybe a new idea to you, maybe all of you have heard of it. Uh, it's a completely different than anything else we've, uh, we've had in the blackberry world. Most of you are familiar with Primocane fruiting raspberries. They've been around for a number of years, although they haven't been around as long as you might think. If you go back and look into Primocane raspberries, you'll find that uh, Heritage was really the first one that came out with any real notoriety. And I've forgotten what year Heritage came out. I believe it was in the 70s. It's about 30 years old. It's still very important. But Heritage was a major breakthrough. It's from New York. And it was the first one that had any significant yield that would yield early enough in the, fa in, in the fall before frost. So some of you are old enough to recognize that 30 years ago is not very long ago. Some of you are thinking 30 years is a long, long time. Um, depends on your perspective. My perspective seems to be changing toward, well, it's not very long now. The reason I looked into that, I was kind of curious to go back and see what Primocane raspberry breeders did that maybe I could learn something from reading. And that's when I found out how few pieces of real information there are. I was on a ride in Italy one day last year with Hugh Dobney. Some of you may know Hugh Dobney. Hugh was released a number of varieties. Most noteworthy in the world is probably Tulamine red raspberry. And I said, Hugh, tell me about Primocane breeding red raspberries. He says, well, you know, I don't really never fooled with them. I not, can't tell you much. Then I realized that I should have had that conversation with George Slate, but I don't believe Dr. Slate's around any longer. He was the person who uh, did the breeding for um, heritage. Uh, one of these buttons advances this, right? You want to just push all of them? <laughs> sure. Where's our equipment operator? Well, I got a blank, okay. Um, if you'll just put my finger on it, I'll... Uh, that one. Okay, that last one. First off, when we talk about primocanes, and some of you may not have any in, in, any involvement with Rubus, the, the genus that involves the blackberries and raspberries, a blackberry is a perennial plant. All of us know that means that the root system lives year after year, but it has biennial canes. Now, that's one thing that's quite unique about Rubus. There are not a lot of species I'm familiar with that have biennial canes, means the canes live two years. The first year canes of a Rubus plant are normally referred to as the primocanes, they're usually vegetative only. They're you, this is among cross all rubus and blackberries most all you're familiar with. The second year they turn into floricanes. Now I've been asked in meetings when do they change from primocanes to floricanes and one day I said February the 19th. <laughs> well it's a 24-hour open window for them to change. And the reason I said that was, it was kind of, I was pleased later that I was this smart on my feet. That's my wife's birthday, so I thought, well, February the 19th. It's sometime during the dormant season, so why not February 19th? Although I realize some of you that might be late in your dormant season and might not hold up. But anyway, there's some magic time in there. But the bottom line, the second year, these primocanes are floricanes, and then these flower, fruit, and then they die. And that throws some folks off. They look out here and say, my canes are dying. They look awful. Well, they're just doing what they're supposed to. Now, primocane fruiting indicates the fruit is born on first year canes. So that's what we're talking about. Canes that come up out of the ground and on that cane that grew that year, it produces flowers and fruit. So pretty interesting notion. Now, also, if these buds that don't fruit the first year, if you leave those canes, then they go this magic floricane uh, transition period, then the rest of the buds on that cane potentially fruit on the floricanes the next year. So, you could have a floricane crop on overwintering canes and then a primocane crop on the canes that come up that season and theoretically two crops. I say theoretically because you remember this still agriculture and farming and different things can happen like death and destruction. So this is what a primocane fruiting blackberry cane looks like. The primocane will terminate in flowers that you see. The fruiting develops down the cane. The remaining buds will break buds over winter and fruit the next year. Now first off, I want to talk a little bit about the potential value of this. 
And y'all are pretty sharp folks and you can probably already spot some, but just for those that might not be familiar with what this is all about, I'll highlight a few things. First off, this offers blackberry production during the later season, parentheses, fall fruiting period. Now I'm careful about fall because you know, fall is elusive. October is fall, September is fall to me. The 25th of July, when sometimes we have ripe primocane fruit, is not fall. This isn't quite fall in Arkansas, and we've got ripe primocane fruit. So it's fall fruiting in more continental or more climates more north. Later season is a little safer to say. So an entirely different time to make fruit. Now that's valuable to you as a gardener. But if you were in the commercial blackberry business and you were sizing up markets, you would know that late August to the 1st of November is the most lucrative potential time for price for a shipping blackberry in the Northern Hemisphere right now. So there's a commercial potential there that uh, right now the only thing that really exists is some Chester that come off at that time, but sometimes Chester uh, is a little hard on customers. The potential to schedule production is based on primocane management. What I mean there is that theoretically at least, you could go in and mow the canes down at a certain date, they grow back up and then they fruit on a certain date. I was walking around over in a raspberry patch over in England one day and uh, I was, they had hoops and all kinds of other things. This is in, uh, um, in July, I believe. And I saw these raspberries that were about knee high and I looked at those for a while and I thought, you know, I don't know much about this country, but I believe it's going to get cold for those things over fruit, reckon what they're doing. And so I asked somebody and he says, well, we mow those canes down until a certain date and then we put hoops over them and fruit them. I said, well, to about Thanksgiving. Well, he looked puzzled about what Thanksgiving was. They don't have that over there. <coughs> I didn't say nothing about the 4th of July, luckily. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, they put a high tunnel plastic over it, keeps them warm, and then fruit them later. And so what they're doing is scheduling production. So I thought, well, that's pretty smart. Later on, piece came to mind that you might do that with a blackberry. The potential of two crops on the same plant, obviously there is a gardening standpoint that's handy. You could get fruit in June and you get fruit crops in on into September or October. That's valuable. Reduction in pruning. If you just wanted a primocane crop only, you just mow the canes down. Now some of you like to get out there and prune thorny blackberries, but there's a lot of folks in this world don't have the character you've got and they want to just mow. And so that comes into play. Avoidance of winter injury. Some of you from Minnesota, Wisconsin, upstate New York, maybe Canada, you can't really grow a blackberry unless you could throw snow over it because it kills the canes. And so the idea that you could grow the crop, the canes, and never encounter cold and just cut them down in the winter is quite appealing, just like a primocane raspberry. And finally, those of you in the south, in theory, you could avoid rosette and double blossom because the canes would be growing. There's no flowers to fall down on and infect the, the, the shoots when these are growing and your flowers were produced and you would not have the disease in theory. Now, there's a lot of things when you, particularly if you have the long seasons of the south, you never know what might happen. Let's talk about where these came from. A somewhat interesting story, at least interesting to me, and it probably will be to you since you folks are interested in a lot of stuff. The story goes in 1959, Ms. L.G. Hillquist from Ashland, Virginia, took a wild primocane fruit and blackberry selection that her husband, Mr. Hillquist, found, took it to the New York State Experiment Station at Geneva. Just took it up there. Now, I don't know uh, exactly anything about this other than she took it up there because they have a record of it. This plant was held there and it was designated Hillquist. People talk about Hillquist being a variety, but I don't know that it was ever released or marketed. It just had the trait. I've seen Hillquist, it's not exactly particularly exciting. It was noted in New York to have a rudimentary level of primocane fruiting. Now that means that it didn't do a whole lot usually. When somebody has a, have a rudimentary level of fun at a party, that means it really wasn't quite as good as they thought it was going to be. Um, hopefully when you get on, you won't walk out of here and say, you know that Clark guy has a rudimentary level of knowledge and his, le his ability to deliver it is even less so. So uh, that's what we're after. We won't Rudimentary is not what we're usually after unless it's a uh, significance of a doctor visit or something. So, and it's a diploid, which means this plant has two sets of chromosomes. Now the blackberries from Arkansas and most of the ones you grow are tetraploids. They have four sets of chromosomes. 
Now, Dr. Jim Moore, most of you have hopefully heard of Dr. Moore. Dr. Moore started the Arkansas Breeding Program in 1964. And Dr. Moore has done a tremendous amount of work on a lot of crops. And uh, I was fortunate enough to come to study under him in 1980 and then worked with him for all these years and took his place in the 90s. And uh, so it's a great.